Thanks. And once again to George Weissel. It's got the best launch sequence that I've ever seen in a space movie. And you gotta go see it in an IMAX theater because the sound is just amazing. Our next panel is really quite amazing as well. And uh, however, I'm not going to introduce it. I'm going to introduce uh, the moderator for the panel who is Anthony Doigan Cabrera, the editor of Ad Astra, our uh, society, the National Space Society's magazine, as well as managing editor for space.com and many other things. He controls space media um, and a lot of other things. So it's great to have him here. It's great to have him moderating this panel. Please join me in welcoming Anthony Doyne Cabrera. Hey, good morning, everybody. Thanks for stopping by. That was great. Uh, this whole conference has been great so far. And I hope you've all been enjoying yourself. Um, this panel that was put together and I was asked to moderate is uh, it's an interesting panel for this year's ISDC in the sense that, um, well, I got into a conversation yesterday with one of the panelists, which is Greg Benford, who will be coming up to join us, and along with Larry Niven, and I believe Jerry Purnell. Um, is Jerry Purnell here in the room? No. So I think the panel today will only be uh, Greg Benford and uh, Larry Niven only. Greg Bedford and Larry Niven will be with us to answer questions, but I was talking with Greg about this panel today, and we decided what would we discuss, what would be the discussion in keeping with uh, the theme of this year's conference. And we hit upon the notion, as well as with Greg's brother Jim, that science fiction, there was a point in time where science fiction really was a launching point for a lot of things that became science fact. Um, you can, I mean, every, the name drop of Arthur C. Clarke and satellites comes to mind, but also a variety of other uh, social issues or technological innovations started out as science fiction ideas. But in recent years, possibly, there's been like a split, a split between what science fiction dreamers and believers are, what that they used to predict, and now it's become kind of internalized and like maybe the prediction power of science fiction to become something more. Uh, has society become so jaded? Are we so used to things like space shuttle launches or Soyuz launches? Or we don't seem to blink an eye that we have robots on Mars. Um, and has there, a, has there become a shift? Is science fiction going from um, the concept that science fiction thought of at first to maybe science fiction now thinks of it last? Um, and so we're going to pursue that, uh, that dialogue and those ideas today with our guests. Um, I'd like to introduce them and bring them up here, if that's possible. Um, start with Greg Benford, uh, novelist and professor of physics at UC Irvine. He's the Nebula award-winning author of the novel Timescape. And uh, he's currently two books in the offing that are Beyond Infinity and uh, The Sunborn. And, uh, the other gentleman we have, and many of you have known him for many, many years, his participation in the NSS, as well as with uh, uh, the ideas that he and Jerry helped put forward uh, during the 80s, working with um, uh, the Reagan administration with regards to the applications of scientific, of science fiction ideas and concepts moving into the reality. It was controversial, remains to this day, uh, the Space Defense Initiative. But it showed a link between people who had these ideas and the reality of making it come true. And that's Larry Niven, the uh, Hugo Lopez and Nebula award-winning author. Uh, you know him from his Ringworld series, his Man Kazin War series. Um, he's written books with Jerry Purnell, Inferno, Lucifer's Hammer. And he currently has a collection of short stories uh, out the Draco Tavern. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, Larry Niven and uh, Greg Benson. Oh, right. That's 
involved in our free form kind of thing. And it was one of the first thing I, things I was told by professionals when I was manager. Uh, you don't get a nickel extra for making a correct prediction. <laughs> <laughs> it's good publicity, but as a general thing, it's not to your point. It's to your team. Even so, we collect we collect correct predictions. We just, we just do. It's a way of counting the food. Uh, I had a, I've had a few recently. Uh, the most recent being uh, living glass. This this idea didn't have a name when I wrote about it. I wrote about it uh, for a number of those space stories, including Grimm. The idea is you've got a windshield or a pair of specs, uh, and if you look at something bright through that, through that windshield, uh, it appears as a black dot. Uh, for each person behind the windshield, uh, it, the windshield gets polarized in the direction of the glare, so you, you, you are never blinded by glare. Very necessary if your son happens to be a uh, G6 or
but it moves away from the concepts of space exploration, um, living on other planets, or uh, even space stations. And is that type of science fiction, has it become more space opera-like as people are our Earth? Or is there any chance we see more resurgence into kept grasping at the idea of like a humanity beyond Earth in science fiction? It seems to have taken a backseat to an almost obsession with technology on Earth and man's interaction with technology. The uh, science fiction of the past has always had people going to space. Uh, it's inevitable they wanted characters to, to be looking around. Uh, sending only machines to space would have been missing the point in fiction. In, in fact, it's a whole lot cheaper and although the space, the human space program has been disappointing, uh, the exploration of space has been going on brilliantly. We found more than we were ever able to predict. Pluto, Pluto for instance, uh, Pluto turns out to be two dots of light if you if you use a good enough telescope. Uh, Pluto is tinier than anyone ever thought, and Karen also, the moon. Uh, they're nearly the same size by astro astronomical standards. Uh, they're, they're both tidally locked. I, I think I was the first one to, first guy to put a prolate spheroid spir in fiction. And now every moon we find is a, is a prolate spheroid because they're all tidally locked, stretched into egg shapes by, by the tides. Uh, Pluto and Karen are both that way. You can link them with a tether because the orbits are circular. Both faces are, are not moving. Uh, link it with a tether and it wouldn't break. You'd have a, you'd have a beanstalk running, running to both bodies. I got, sorry, I, I'm easily distracted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah I, the point is that we're interested in exploration of the solar system. But, but you're quite right that starting about uh, well, actually, always in the middle in science fiction, there's been social science fiction that's worried about where we're going socially. And uh, Faye in the 1950s, in Gallus and Magazine, uh, people like Warren Ruth and Fred Paul have maximized in that, although Fred Paul can do anything. Uh, the real trick is, is, is the useful. I mean, well, what's the point of being able to envision the future if you do nothing about it? And I've had many experiences of that phenomenon. When I was at a postdoc, I was at a liberal mark, uh, my, just after my doctorate, I was hired by Edward Teller, and I got introduced to DARPANET, uh, which was very clunky in those days, but still amazing. And only a few months later, I realized the potentials for what we used to call bad code. And I wrote a memo pointing out that people could attach code that would self-reproduce, and I even called it virus, it's a net virus. And I then wrote there were only about 12 lines of Fortran code to propagate on other messages, and they started turning up all the way through the net. And guess what? We had an interesting meeting in which people said, first, this is a bad idea. I said, yeah, I was I pointed it out. And they said, second, why would anyone do this? <laughs> And I realized that the mere anticipation of an idea isn't enough. You actually have to make it plausible for people. And the people of Livermore basically did not believe in the existence of bad actors. This may surprise you considering that Livermore was based, or built in order to build hydrogen warheads. Uh, so I wrote this up actually and published it. 1970, and then wrote a science fiction story about it because I realized the people in the computing business, the people in Carpenter, just thought it was completely impossible that anyone would ever do this. What was the payoff? Uh, and I sort of quoted a song only five years old in by Bob Dylan The pump don't work because the vandals took the handles. And they hadn't heard of that either. <laughs> so I published the story in the 1970s, and, uh, and, and then it got picked up by John. Brunner and David Gerald, and then out into the world, and the first real viruses, I mean, for, for 
published this attempt where it launched in the 70s. And since then, people have claimed to have invented the idea, but actually I've got a postmark on it. But the point is I've never advertised it precisely because it's fundamentally bad news. And most science fiction is about good news. Uh, and I really learned a lot from that incident. Uh, there is actually no prize for being right. There is also no, no truth in the rumor that uh, science fiction is mostly about good news. <laughs> yeah, that's, <laughs> that's right. And most drama, you know, is not about good news. I mean, an adventure story is essentially somebody else doing something dangerous a fairly far distance away. And that's why you enjoy it, because it's a fairly far distance away. Yeah. You told me as you're done, you've got to look yeah. at the world all the time. Yes. <laughs> Yes, positive visions don't hold up. And it took a long time for people to realize that. that you really need to put your characters in trouble. That's what every writer knows. Put them in trouble and then get them out of it. And if they do, it's science fiction. And if they don't, it's tragedy. <laughs> so Eskimos knew all this over 2,000 years ago. It's still science fiction. I'm thinking of dishes, uh, yeah. dishes genocide. Oh, yeah. Oh, that uh, the other media came first. Uh, people didn't notice that 
Bill Gibson's uh, Neuromancer came after uh, the Disney, I think Disney from Tron, and after Blade Runner, which looked very cyberpunky, but all that came from outside the genre. The genre actually picked it up and ran with it, but it was a, with a dystopian bias. And I think uh, the whole mood of our culture is worse than that is, uh, people, let's put it this way, you go into a park, right, and there's a statue of somebody. It's never to the guy who recognized the problem was coming. It is to the guy who solved it. Or else a jump. We're still going down in the celebration after the end of the Cold War. Yeah. We, we, elected, we elected ourselves a corn king so we could have a tremendous party, right? Uh, the, the eight years of the Clinton administration were, were the greatest party we've ever had. And of course, we're a little depressed after. We all got drunk. Yes, so, so okay, let's use that metaphor. Who gets, who gets elected next? Who gets the kind of after, after the one came, what do you get? I had no, no theory that they would elect George Bush's son no. uh, after throwing him out after one term. I know, oh. I, uh, oh. I, I was in D.C. in the 1980s and we were up like, working on something. Uh, and, uh, and a guy came through the group, uh, just glad handed and so forth. He looked out of place and said, from my ear, who's the guy over there? He said, oh, forget about him, he's nobody, he's the vice president's son. <laughs> uh, yeah, nobody, well, maybe we'll get the corn queen. Okay. <laughs> hey, I hope she won't be a downer. <laughs> Next religion. <laughs>
Um, and it was space colonization fields were all offshore. Uh, yeah. Yeah, if you had wealth in space, you could be brought to space. Yeah. It's a long tradition of that. Jerry O'Neill Longbird, or for that matter, the world's talking about prediction. In the brink moon, Edward Everett Hale. Let's put it that way. The place where he was in history by realizing that he was the man who introduced Abraham Lincoln at Gettysburg to give the address. Oh, an amazing historical fact. This is the same guy who wrote The Brick Moon, which envisions two ways of getting back to Earth by ablation strategy. And the second method is it was a brick moon because it had tiles on the outside which would enable you to re-enter. He had already thought of this problem at the time of the Civil War. Another example of how anticipating the problem is not solving. Uh, but but you know, that's the point. Science fiction is the greatest in an American literary invention because the way to look at modern culture is that the rise of genres in the 20th century is mostly because it took place in the free country on Earth. The Americans invented lots of genres. We invented the musical comedy, Broadway comedy, uh, modern science fiction, modern fantasy, jazz, rock and roll, all the things that proliferated because it was an open society. And therefore, to some extent, it's our responsibility to handle this popular culture. Popular culture really does impress diversity of opinions in humanity in a way that no culture had ever managed before. That's our greatest strength. This is why, for example, our great strength is not the class of the 19th century southern novel, although Mark Twain did a pretty damn good job, but because diversity is the real answer, and I to explode this metaphor further, that's actually what we're now seeing in you people is the true key to space. Diversity, not monolithic control. And that's the greatest metaphor that science fiction forward now. Keep it happening, keep it happening differently, but never indifferently. We are half a century behind. Uh, half a century ago, the government was able to do what the uh, what Spaceship One does now. Yes. So the future is in your hands. I need to leave, leave. I need to live an extra half a century yeah. Hey, if there's someone with a mic out there who'd like to open up to anyone in the audience with a question, the young lady out here from the name. Yeah, get your hand up right there. Yeah, you know that uh, popular polls say that the people feel that things are going to get worse in the future. I wondered what each of your individual opinions were about the brightness or darkness of our future. Wow. Bright. Bright for you or bright for everybody? <laughs> <laughs> Mostly I've seen lots of things improve. I've got a toothbrush that would have been magical 30 years ago. Yes, it's a vibrator for the mouth. My <laughs> <laughs> problems with my dentist have been increasing. Uh, just, just pulling that out of my hat. My car guides me. My car guided me here this morning. I knew where I was going. I let the car do it anyway. Uh, I don't have to get lost anymore. That is wonderful. <laughs> uh, yeah, I've always seen it. And it's always been pretty much true. And it's almost never matched exactly what I saw, thought I saw coming. Yes. I agree. I, I see a brightening future for a lot of people and a worse one for some other people. But the real problem is whether we're going to meet the new conceptual challenges to the entire human race. I mean, uh, my only hope the point is that we have to actually come to grips with the fact that we're the biggest influence on the environment and we have to start becoming true stewards of the earth, actually managing most of the planet, which is the, the, the greatest reason for the space program. You can't
can't manage a world if you can't get outside it and look back at it and understand its systems and then manipulate them often from space itself. That's one maybe the critical thing that we can do as a community is say that the space community is the ultimate environmental community because it inherently envisions the world as a whole system and can manage it from one side. Uh, the, I was just last weekend lunch with Lowell Wood and Ken Caldera, the old buddies of mine, and, and we all agreed the cheapest way to, to manage the greenhouse problem is to put a thermal lens in it slightly refractory lens at the L1 point. It's actually cheap, and it's permanent, and it does the least harm. Uh, but try to sell that. Big object in space. Uh, it takes a long time for such an idea to take hold, and the lesson of history is usually it comes in in the ninth minute, and then you try to get it all in one. I did not believe Mecca would survive into the 23rd century. I thought it'd be gone by now. Russians, uh, Arabs, sorry. Uh, Muslims are just too good at missing people off. I will repeat the prediction. Mecca will not survive till 2025. Told you really to talk to me. Yeah, hey, that's not religion. Thanks for that statement. Oh, uh, didn't uh, Thomas More, Sir Thomas More, St. Thomas More invent science fiction? When you say it's an American, uh, as a Canadian, I, by the way, I'm a little bit uh, I mean, critical, North America. critical of everything being American. Canadians are American. It's North America. North America. I mean, I'm throwing you the Mexicans. All right. 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 But in any case, I'm not going to that. But isn't it Sir Thomas More who was credited? I just read this recently. Uh, I've been reading a biography of uh, Sir Thomas More. And uh, it said right off that he was the first science fiction writer. Yeah, but Lucius of Samoa, uh, Lucius of Samoa, the Greek writer, actually envisioned voyage to the moon. There you are. Eight, eight, five, 1,500 years. Yeah, well, why do you say uh, it's an American the Americans? Because they're actually Americans and we just don't know. Anki Alighieri was a first science fiction writer. It was uh, the sciences he used were sciences in his days, even if they largely turned to fantasy and argument. Uh, he, he even wrote the first science fiction trilogy. You need not be confused by the fact that it's written in poetry. Poetry is very easy in Italian. Uh, everything rhymes. <laughs> yes. uh, actually, but it's a serious point. I actually, the, my reservation was I said modern science fiction <laughs> is a product of the genreification of culture, which is the, the, the Trump suit of the North America. His work was an odyssey, which a lot of science fiction is. His work was a trilogy, which a lot of science fiction is. Uh, and it kind of fell down near the end, which a lot of science fiction is. <laughs> That's right. That's right. And there's a problem with the dialogue, too. It's technical. Uh, that was a digression. The reason we're called Americans is because we're the only country that has the word America in its name. Next question. <laughs> uh, science fiction writers are uh, considered to be those who uh, dream and inspire people about the future. Uh, and they have that freedom of uh, being unrestrained. Uh, technical people uh, kind of live with the facts and, uh, and the laws uh, of physics and uh, rocket equation and so forth. Now, Bert Rutan fits into the latter category, and you guys fit into the to the dreamers. Uh, this is sort of two-part uh, question. The, the first part is Bert says that we need a breakthrough of some sort in order to be able to uh, get to Earth orbit economically enough for uh, safe passenger travel. And the uh, the second part of it has to do with something that I spent uh, a wonderful time uh, collaborating with another science fiction writer. Uh, and Arthur Clarke uh, thought it was a, a very good uh, task. Uh, and, and I can read you a phrase or two from his foreword in this. 
But in, in this story, Encounter with Tiger, we got around the breakthrough by having the aliens give it to us here. And then we use that breakthrough uh, to be able to travel to the stars. Uh, that has been thought of before. Well, we, we never uh, claimed any originality uh, to that. And we used Alpha Centauri, and we all know that Alpha Centauri uh, does exist. <clears throat> and, and it uh, may not have uh, uh, planets and moons, moons around it, but it uh, is something that's familiar. Now, you two guys sort of represent different societies here, so I'm, I'm just wondering if, what, what is your opinion of the reality expressed uh, in uh, Encounter with Tiger? <clears throat> because I feel that of all the things that I have done, it can be one of the more inspiring ones. Really? I, I kind of thought the moon landing was pretty good. <laughs> by networking of two people, yeah. stealing a little here and there of, of uh, what other people said. But I just wanted to remind a few people of what Arthur Clarke said. It doesn't seem fair. There was a time when we science fiction writers had space all to ourselves and could do just what, what we like with it. Not anymore. People like Buzz have been there and they can tell us exactly where we went wrong. Almost. And now, to add insult to injury, they're writing science fiction themselves. Even worse, it's damn good science fiction. Yes, it's true. <laughs> Painful though it is to make such an admission, I would have been proud to have written Encounter with Tiger myself. Now this is realistic, technical projection, not really science fiction. And there is a big difference. And I think Apollo 13 was very popular but it wasn't fiction, it wasn't space cowboys, it was reality, and it was very popular. So I think dealing with reality in an inventive, creative way, inspiring way, with all the things you guys know how to do, is uh, worth more to our future, because it's not misleading the youth into expecting that space elevators and other things are going to be right around the corner. Thanks, so. The most productive science fiction I have read actually has been grant proposals. Would you like us on the, the, the man 
that is so cool. Uh, I, I was picturing it as a movie, and I was afraid it had to, it had to be made by the time it existed. Yeah. And therefore, it's some time travel and all of that. Yeah. All kinds of time tracks. People keep rewriting the space program, and I'm as guilty as anybody. Oh, yeah. I mean, I wrote it all in the Martian race, which is about how to get there. Using left over from NASA as a private enterprise, using the guy who's thinly modeled and Ted Turner. I mean, we do have people who can actually send us to Mars out of their hip pocket. Uh, Bill Gates, for example, if he wasn't trying physically trying to increase the population here. Bill Gates had a lot. Yeah. I am told, I'll speak for Jerry because he isn't here. The author of the name of Bill Gates' answer was. For the cost of putting a base on the moon, uh, he would have to supervise it, and he didn't want to supervise it. Yes, he's got the money, but it would eat the rest of his life. For <laughs> uh, Some years ago. Yeah. Question for both of you. Uh, what do you see as the most profound enigma that we see in the solar system now? Enigma? Same physics, 
can support a vehicle of a couple of hundred kilograms um, with about the power of a megawatt. I mean, that's, but that's, to me, in my life, that's been a direct one one map of an old SF image. And there are others like it for other people. So uh, the, the record of science fiction in predicating inventions is well known. In fact, I just mentioned something that Edison goes to Mars. And that's a valuable part of our culture. You have to imagine it before you can do it. I'd like to hang that city from, uh, from an orbit and tell you. Okay. Except this, there's a lot of drag in the atmosphere. Yeah, uh, let's see. Drag in the atmosphere, it isn't moving over the equator. We just work the Oh, so the equator. Okay, well this one works anyway. Because we, we actually developed it for use over the poles for a stationary position. So you can see a thousand kilometers in either direction. It's even cheaper. Uh, NOAA spends $400 million a year just on orbital surveillance for satellites. Because they wear out. Um, I would just like to make a comment. I think that the great party was the Reagan years that they years because Clinton actually had the federal budget in the black when he left office. It was Reagan who all this party into place and all this. I mean, the United States, I think there were two great warships in the 20th century, Roosevelt and Reagan. And I think we're still very much in a sense in the early 1980s of the age of Reagan. And the philosophies and outlook of Reagan and administration. True, but there was more drinking in the Clinton administration. It's certainly true. I had a lot of fun during the Reagan. That counts. That's a little thing that counts in long run. <laughs> all right, I want to thank you all for uh, coming today and sending a special thanks to uh, Greg Benford and Larry.